welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. Our guest today is Tara. She's the daughter of a disabled U.S. Marine Corps veteran who had to leave her position in government health care after falling ill with the first of three rare diseases that are associated with her dad's exposure to Agent Orange. It's a dioxide dioxin, uh, dioxin <laughs> used while he was serving in the Vietnam War. Her goal today is to shed light on those who are struggling with the many disabling or debilitating conditions from Agent Orange and other rare diseases, to advocate for those who are struggling to find help, their voice, and are unable to advocate for themselves. Hi, Tara. Hi, Tara. Hi. Tara, to give our audience some background on Agent Orange, um, birth defects are showing up in children of veterans who served in America's military during the Vietnam War. Uh, the, the military actually sprayed more than 20 million gallons of the powerful defoliant in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia to deny the enemy food sources and cover. Tens of thousands of American military personnel handled, sprayed, or were sprayed by the herbicide. The chemicals in Agent Orange are known to cause a variety of illnesses, including several types of cancers, among other diseases. The list of illnesses tied to Agent Orange is posted on the Department of Veterans Affairs website, and they include, and I may struggle with some of these. Good but, luck, Gran. <laughs> um, <laughs> AL, amyloidosis, chronic B cell Leukemias. 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 Mm -hmm. Told you I was going to struggle. Mm -hmm. Chlorocne. Is that right? Well, we could try. Okay. And, and, and actually, I was just watching, there's a Netflix um, series on now about um, spies. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the individuals who they att attempted to assassinate with dioxins has this. And it's very, very, um, it's a, vi a very visual type thing you can oh, wow. really okay. you can definitely discern that that's what that is wow. okay um there's also diabetes type di two yep thank you hodgkin's disease ischemic heart disease multiple myeloma also non-hodgkin's lymphoma parkinson's disease peripheral neuropathy uh at least the early onset of it porphyria cutanea tarda mm -hmm. i hope i got that right it also includes prostate cancer and other respiratory cancers, uh, such as lung cancer, uh, cancer of the larynx, trachea, and bronchus. Um, also, soft tissue sarcomas, other than osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma, Kaposi sarcoma, or mesothelioma, um, and a group of different types of cancers in the body tissue, such as muscle fat, I'm sorry, muscle fat, blood, and limb vessels, and also connective tissue. And it took decades for the Department of Veterans Affairs to admit that the powerful herbicide poisoned thousands of their military members. Right. Um, that's right, Ron. And yeah. the children of the men and women that served um, and were affected by Agent Orange have a um, possibility of being you know, like the children might be born with spina bifida. That's quite common. Um, and that's a birth defect that occurs while still in, in utero and where the spinal cord fails to close at the bottom. Um, and then children of women that served in the same situation have a larger set of possible birth defects um, that the VA does recognize. And that's because um, women are born with the same number of um, eggs. You know, they, they carry those with them their entire lives, whereas men are constantly producing new sperm. Right. And we are going to get to our guest in a minute. I know. Yeah. I, I hate to put you off, but we're, we're just trying to save you uh, some of the uh, the background information here, Tara. Uh, according no, to, I appreciate it. That's okay. <laughs> uh, according to the VA, the covered birth defects for children born to women who served in Vietnam and the Korean demilitarized zone include... Okay, now it's my turn. Exactly. <laughs> Echondroplasia cleft lip and cleft palate, congenital heart diseases, 
congenital talip, talips equinovirus. Oh, that's called clubfoot. Okay, I should have just said clubfoot. Esophageal and intestinal atresia. Hallerman Steif or Steif, Strife, Hallerman Strife syndrome. Boy, Jack's going to have fun editing this one. Or Dom, I don't or know. Or Dominic, <laughs> whoever gets lucky Dominic's on this one. Dominic's shaking his head no. <laughs> <laughs> Hip dysplasia, Hirschsprung's disease, which is a congenital megacolon, hydrocephalus due to aqueductal stenosis, Hyposp- uh, hypospadias, hypospadias, we'll say hypospadias, Imporforte anus, Neural tube defects, Poland syndrome, pyloric stenosis, syndactyl or fused digits. Oh, that's like web feet. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, tracheosophageal fistula. I did pretty good on that one. Undescended testicle, Williams syndrome. And, and we laughed at, at the fact that we can't pronounce these right. things. Yeah, we're but not laughing at the diseases. No, no the these sad, are the sad part about it is this agent orange causes all of this. Yes, right, right. Yes. And I mean, Tara, you must have become like an, uh, you know, you have to know so much and learn so much because these are things that people normally normally don't even think about. Yeah, haven't even heard of. It's not in our everyday vocabulary. No. So, Tara, <laughs> back to you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with us today. We really appreciate it. Now, can you start our listeners out? by telling us what conditions are you personally dealing with? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to speak about this because as you just mentioned, all of those conditions that I'm going to put in air quotes, recognize Mm -hmm. um, as being caused by Agent Orange, there are a slew of (laughs) other conditions and along with medical research out there that supports connections between Agent Orange and these conditions, although they're not identified as being recognized. I myself have just in the past three and a half years been diagnosed with three of those. The first is a vascular necrosis, which I have in both knees, both hips, and both shoulders. Mm. A vascular necrosis is the, the first that I was diagnosed with, which is technically called multifocal because I have it all over. There are many citations out there that support the association between Agent Orange and a vascular necrosis. And the second diagnosis that I had was intracranial hypertension, which I actually um, caused me to go blind, oh. completely blind, and oh. I was never supposed to... I was never supposed to see again. Mm. Ended up having to have a brain operation and a BP shunt. But that, it's a central nervous system disorder that affects your your ventricles, your vessels, which is linked to the Agent Orange dioxin, similar to spina bifida, Chiari, Mm -hmm. which there's literature out there supporting the connection to that as well. Mm -hmm. And the third that... I was diagnosed with last year was interstitial lung disease, which causes doctors to ask if I've been around birds, but it's not just me. My sister also gets it. And there is also a slew of research out there showing the connection between respiratory conditions, not just lung cancer, respiratory cancers that are related to Agent Orange. And as recently as July 21st, 2020, there was a research article on that by, it's on the VA website for uh, lung diseases saying that additional research needs to be done for the veterans. So if all this research still needs to be done for the veterans, there's still so much that has to happen just for their descendants, their Mm -hmm. offspring. Mm -hmm. So- Right, right. Because I've heard that it's also pa- being passed on to the grandchildren. So it, it must be doing something yes. in the genetic links, right? Yes. Yes. It's multi-generational. And it can lie dormant for years. Like mine didn't, it didn't show up until I was 40. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and 
my sister my sister was actually born with webbed feet which they recognize as one of the uh Conditions. things that c- correct that can be passed on to descendants that mm-hmm. and she also has the same lung condition that i have but so we both have it wow well, and, and dioxins are also found um in other areas so i mean it's something that if you're you know say your your family wasn't exposed to agent orange but you know you should be aware if like landscapers you th- are you th- saying no like um paper Farm? mills oh um they they are found in other areas in in industry and this actually does kind of hit close to home because um agent orange was originally developed at the university of illinois as means to help grow soybeans mm. and it wasn't it used it originally like very weapon. low doses and then the the military weaponized it yeah. basically yeah well, thank you, Tara. I think our listeners have a better understanding of what we're going to be talking about now. Uh, since we only discuss one, one diagnosis per episode, we would like to discuss your battle with multifocal vascular necrosis, also known as AVN. Uh, perhaps you're willing to come back on another episode and talk about the other problems individually. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Great, thank great. You. So we could make this into like a, a, a mini a series. series. Yes, yeah. yes. Right. Because, I, I mean, it's, it's really... That would be really, really great. Yeah. And I don't know if you're aware, but Gene and I are both uh, veterans, and we always support any veteran uh, activity that's out there because it's also supporting us. Yeah. Well, and yeah, we Aww. can kind of understand that when you when you volunteer for the military, you know, there's a lot of things that you're going to be exposed to that right. normal we, Actually, we just said that. Person. Yeah, we were just saying this morning that, uh, you know... It, the vaccine for COVID is not mandatory. They can't really make it mandatory. However, in the military, it would be mandatory right. because you're giving away your life for your country. Yeah. Right. However, does that mean you're giving away your children's lives, your right. grandchildren's lives? This is where this topic is going to be important. And, and there is there is the onus on them to keep their personnel safe and, yeah. and whenever possible prevent, you know, disease and right. illness and, right. and that kind of situation. right. Yep, I completely agree. And oftentimes, you know, the the military families, the sacrifices that they make when their loved ones are off serving or the the sacrifices, in, in this case, their health. Mm-hmm. So I completely agree. <laughs> well, yeah, we never would have expected this type of a reaction based on Agent Orange, but now we're learning. Yeah. In, in, I know. Can, Tara, can you tell us um, what is AVN and which bones? You said that you have it. It's multi shoulders. Yeah, shoulders and and everything. Can you tell us which exact which joints are affected in your body? And what is it? And what is it? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, avascular necrosis is it's the result of reduction of the blood flow to the bones. Okay. I I have it in both knees, both hips, both shoulders, which basically means my bones didn't get enough of the blood which caused them to start to die and once the bones start to die they don't just regenerate themselves Mm -hmm. now here's an interesting fact i was diagnosed with this three and a half years ago my dad the better the vietnam veteran was just diagnosed with that three months ago oh my gosh and there's multiple like i said there's multiple citations out there of so many other veterans and their descendants who have also been diagnosed with avascular necrosis. But what it does is as the the bone dies, it brings the entire joint with it. So Mm -hmm. oftentimes it's missed. It's not diagnosed until it's until a later stage, which makes it a lot more complex. And it's very hard to find does it start for. out, yeah, the symptoms as they start out, is it, it does it feel like a, an arthritic type of a feeling, or how did um, the symptoms start with you? Well, what started, interestingly, I woke up one morning and I thought that I had twisted my knee in my sleep, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it felt like a torn ligament in my knee, oh, okay. and I ended up going to the emergency room, and I was misdiagnosed with bone cancer. Oh, because oh wow it yeah it it looks like bone like white specks all in mm-hmm. my bones mm-hmm. and that's the dead bone marks they're oh. called it's called bone infarct so i have that as well as as the death on the end of the bone 
which is the avascular necrosis too. So um, that was the initial diagnosis, and I it took me all over the country. I ended up going to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, too, trying mm-hmm. to find a diagnosis and help, which ultimately landed me in New York City um, at New York Presbyterian, where I found a doctor to do a bilateral hip procedure on me to try and slow down the progression. Okay. So, um, and maybe I should touch more on, I guess, how do you want me to touch more on the connection between avascular necrosis and Agent Orange? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. hold on. Let me get, let me get there. Mm Mm-hmm. My notes. See, that's what she, Jean was saying. You have to become a an expert, a subject matter yes, expert. Yes. I think there should be honorary doctorates. Yes, for patients like you. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to be your own like advocate, and that's the biggest mm-hmm. challenge, especially because it's considered rare. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of doctors who actually have the knowledge that you need, so you get misdiagnosed and mm-hmm. you get misinformation which causes you to lose time and mm-hmm. your options for treatment diminish. Yeah, so um, hold on one second. Sorry. And I, I think uh, Mayo Clinic is very interesting in Rochester, Minnesota, because the weather gets so cold there. I like to call it Mole City. I don't know if they would agree with me <laughs> yeah, calling it Mole yeah, City. Yeah, the tunnels. But there's tunnels underground that connect the hospital to like the hotels, the hospital to the grocery store, to the library. So you don't have to go out yes. in that freezing cold and it's wind. It's very nice. Yeah. It's it's, very it's nice. unique. It's it's kind of fun. Right. And there's little shops all along the route. Yes. Okay. Here we are. So um, the connection with the avascular necrosis and um, Agent Orange. So avascular necrosis, like I said, it's a result of the reduction of the blood flow to the um, the bones. Mm-hmm. And Agent Orange has an adverse effect on blood vessels. So okay. there's medical liter- literature that supports um, Agent Orange and the dioxin is capable of, of lying dormant and the effects that it has on the blood vessels. Mm-hmm. So it, it's actually the result. Yeah. Hold on one second. I know I, I, I read the word stenosis in a couple of the different um, resulting. Citations. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, stenosis is, is reducing an, in size. So possibly the blood vessel size is reduced at the at the bone could that be part of it yes it's because it's not getting because of that the blood is not flowing the way that it needs to right and i guess most yeah. people don't think of their bones as first of all even needing a blood source yeah but yeah. you don't realize that the osteocytes and and everything inside your bone is you know that there's constant growth mm-hmm. in bone and that it's still I know. yeah because you think it's like set in stone but really it's you know part of your living um it's your body. It's yeah. part of your body that's, you know, it's constantly don't regenerating. It. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. It is. And a lot of people also kind of confuse avascular necrosis, which is also called osteonecrosis, but they confuse it with osteoporosis. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh. They think that you right. Have, oh, they're like, you have osteoporosis. I'm like, it's it's not osteoporosis. No, no. It's no. osteonecrosis. Right. And different. Right, right. It's completely different. Um, mm-hmm. I went through that initially to once I found out that it was the avascular necrosis, it was uh, very challenging to explain to people actually what it was sure. who had assumed that it was osteoporosis. You know, as, as we're talking, I just, it reminds me, and this is going way back when I was in college, I had done a paper on the banning of chemicals in Agent Orange. Mm-hmm. Um, it was done like in the uh, mid seventies or something like that, because they knew it was bad. Mm-hmm. They just didn't know how bad. Oh wow! And this is where the stuff that we're talking about now is the result of all the research from that. But way back in the eighties, when I did this paper, mm-hmm. they knew that this stuff was bad, and that's why they said no more of these chemicals. Mm-hmm. Well, it kind of reminds me of um, lead in fuel, mm-hmm. and you know, like to prove that it was perfectly fine, which it's not, um, the someone actually dipped their hands into it and then later on developed all sorts of cancers in both arms. But, you know, like we, I guess it takes time and research and, 
you know, you have to think about the effects down the road. Um, the long term, absolutely. Yeah, and it's not, yeah, it's a challenge. Right. Yeah, and I remember reading um, somewhere that the amount of chemical that was used over there covered the span of, I think it was like Kentucky and another state combined. Oh, wow. Um, and it was actually the the combination of the chemicals in Agent Orange, the, I think it's TCDD, uh, tetrachlora benzodioxin, the, the TCDD, it's the chemical group of compounds named um, dioxins. And that's what makes Agent Orange as notorious as, as it is. Um, and it's actually considered the most toxic of all dioxins, which is saying a lot because yeah. dioxins are notoriously toxic. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I, I don't know if you guys watched Chernobyl, that show. I haven't seen that one yet. It's on my list. Oh, I'm, I'm wondering how come they haven't done something like this for Agent Orange. That's interesting. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, and even to see it, oh, what has it done to the population in Vietnam? In, yeah, in Vietnam, because um, you know it's a long-lasting um, chemical, and it's yeah, it's got to have long-term effects. Right. Yeah, and yeah. then it's also in the environment at large. <laughs> yep, and there is actually I've read a lot of things about the effects of the what's happening in Vietnam because mm-hmm. of this. Um, it's still being in the soil. Mm-hmm. So and it, and there's probably. Um, you know, if you're going to uh, have research and information, that's probably a good source as well because they have a probably a greater population um, from the exposure. And actually, I think that takes us to Ron's exactly. question. Exactly. Um, can you tell us how common is avascular necrosis, um, and actually, how how is it treated? Sure. So, avascular necrosis um, is probably anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people a year are diagnosed with it. So in order to be considered a rare disease, it's 200,000 or less. Mm-hmm. Um, avascular necrosis is 10 to 20,000. Okay. So to treat avascular necrosis, and I need to give a plug here because a lot of my information, um, Dr. Michael Mont at Lenox Hill, who has, I was scheduled to have surgery on both knees, both hips, and both shoulders in um, September of this Mm -hmm. past year. But due to COVID and all of that, Mm -hmm. um, a couple of other mishaps, I actually kind of got sick with my lungs, too. We're postponing it. But um, Mm -hmm. he is phenomenal. He is the avascular necrosis guru, let me say that. So a lot of what I am speaking to is from literature that I've read that he wrote and talks about. So as far as treatments go for avascular necrosis, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't get a diagnosis until later in stage three. To give a little background on this, there is different staging, I guess, models that are used. There's RCAT. And if you use the RCAT, there's, um, or ARCO, there's four stages. The first two stages are only identifiable on an MRI. So most people aren't going to, if you go to the doctor and you have knee pain or something, they're not, they're going to do an x-ray. And when they don't Mm -hmm. see anything, it's like, oh, I don't, you're fine. Most, a lot of times, you don't go for an MRI for multiple reasons. Mm-hmm. So you don't get diagnosed until the pain progresses and it gets really bad. Well, it's during those first two stages where you have the less invasive procedures that are options that could help prolong you possibly um, your bones completely dying and needing total replacements and um, it becoming uh, mobility issues as well. So okay. another interesting fact here too, and I'm kind of all over the board, but you know, <laughs> it, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it turns out to be a, like a spider web. You know, one thing leads to another. But go ahead, take your time. I know, um, avascular necrosis. There are a couple kind of well-known people that had it. A Rod had it in his shoulder. Mike Napoli, oh, oh, yeah. um, the Red Sox played for the Red Sox, but theirs were caught. It was caught really early because they had to go through rigorous physicals. Mm-hmm. So they had really high success, but I can't, 
stress the importance of, especially if somebody has history of Agent Orange and they're having hip pain or, or something of that nature and their knees, hips, or shoulders or something, especially if they have underlying health issues that prompt them to need a prednisone or steroids because that contributes to it. That's, it's like a perfect storm okay. with the Agent Orange to cause Bay vascular necrosis. Okay. So did I... I no, that yeah, that makes sense. That makes question. sense. Right, I, right. Okay. I didn't finish answering the question though because I only. No, that's okay. But at least that gives some background. Later. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, and I, I, I think, um, you know, if you go to, you know, your orthopedist, and you, I don't think, you know, is it typical for them to ask you? So, did your parents, you know, serve in Vietnam? Were they exposed to Agent Orange? It's, if it's not on their um, intake information, you really do have to advocate for yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. So the um, the treatments again, um, the the initial treatments are are what? Okay, there you go. See, I didn't even answer it. So there, <laughs> there's a there there's a, quite a few different treatments. Um, for the stage, uh, and it's a little bit controversial too, because um, because it's rare and most people don't get diagnosed until stage three and four that mm -hmm. means that there's not a lot of people to actually do tests on or um, okay. trials right. on for oh, stage okay. one and two or sure. for stage the earlier stages sure. but um, um a very popular and somewhat controversial depending on who you talk to is a, a core decompression um where they use um bone marrow effort stem cells mm-hmm so what a what a core decompression is is they take um, and drill holes into your bones, mm -hmm. <laughs> and right. they inject stem cells into the bone marrow, mm -hmm. in hopes of regenerating the bone. Uh, would they be your own stem cells? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But okay. they also have for earlier stages too. They also do PRP for protein rich mm -hmm. um, the plasma stem cells. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as far as treatment for the later stages, and that, so, so why I said it was controversial is because some orthopedists will say that if you have a, a core decompression, you're kind of wasting your time because it might buy you a little time, but you're still ultimately going, it's still going to collapse in the long run. And you're still going to have to go through all of the other things. So why even do the core decompression? Hmm. Um, so it's just so a, it's just a, uh, a, a temporary stop a stopgap. Yeah. yeah. But how much time? Yeah. It varies, and it's not always that's mm -hmm. it's not always the case. I had um, the bilateral hip core decompression in January of 2018, and. I mean, I had tremendous relief after I did, and so far, like it, it hasn't gotten to the point to where I would need like to have it again. Mm -hmm. Like the pain hasn't gotten to, to that point to where it was before I had that surgery. So it, but there's other people who have had success and haven't had to go on and have any further surgery. So it's. It's not a um, everyone will will have to. It's there might be some that do and some that don't, and so the some that that do ultimately have to go on and have it. That causes them to say that not to have it. I don't know. So it is controversial. Okay. If you ask anybody, you'll get mixed reviews on whether you should or shouldn't. But right. the 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 guru, uh, Dr. Michael Mont, will tell you yes to do the cordy compression and i'm okay. right there with him <laughs> okay a majority then, of the time i guess it depends there's things that so so let me just kind of say this mm -hmm. there's it depends on how much of the articular surface though is covered with de it has dead bone like okay. if there's 75 percent or more um that has dead bone or if it's less like so there's so many different if that, then, then that. Right, you know right. I mean? so, kind of like with cancer, you know, they, they treat cancer based on how much 
progression there is. Are they going to use radi radiation or chemo? So I'm sure that they base it based on, like you're saying, how bad it's progressed, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, but that's for the first, um, the stage one and stage two. Stage three and four get more complex. Okay. So you have a variety of different options depending on, like I said, how much dead bone there is mm -hmm. as well as where it's at, where the, the dead bone is at. I have um, dead bone. Uh, it's 75% on one side, 85% on the other, my hips, and my knees are actually stage three. And my, my, my right left shoulder is stage three. My right is stage two. And what that means is that some of the more less the, the less invasive procedures maybe don't have a, a high success possibility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't possibly work, shall I say. Does that make sense? It does. But is, is like um, replacement of the joint a possibility? Is the what? I'm sorry. Can, can they replace the joints? Yes. But you wouldn't do that until stage later. Well, it depends on how much pain you're having, too. And a lot of it is derived by, by that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yes, replacing it is an option. So, and let me just explain this. This is the best explanation that somebody gave me on how to explain avascular necrosis. So, avascular, a lot of people think that avascular necrosis is like your joint something happened because you can get a joint replacement. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is picture like whenever they lay a road, a uh, paver road, they lay mm -hmm. sand down first and then they lay asphalt on top of it. But as you get a pothole, what happens is that sand settles. And as the sand settles, then it pulls that asphalt down. So that's the same thing that's happening with the bone as the bone is dying because that's what a vascular necrosis is, is the bone dying. As it's mm -hmm. dying, it's pulling down and that's what pulls your joint down and all of that. And it, it pulls all your ligaments and cartilage down. And that's why you have to have all of it replaced. So it's like sinkholes in the bone. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because your bones, they're dying and they're, they're collapsing. And okay. so as it does, it's taking everything with it. And it's not just the not just the bone at the joint itself, but could it uh, occur anywhere along the bone? Yes, I I actually have it. That's called bone infarcts. I have mm -hmm. avascular necrosis um, at the ends of my bones, and then I have bone infarcts, which is uh, dead bone patches throughout the long parts of my bones too, gotcha. which is where a lot of the um the can that's where the cancer misdiagnosis came because sure. it looks like that it shows up white in the images okay, okay. but yes well yeah for stage three and four they have multiple different options like there's an oats procedure a vascular graft procedure ultimately yes a total replacement would be i guess that I want to say worst case scenario, mm -hmm. but before the media, the age, it a replacement for your hip would only last 10 years. Okay. So they try to hold off. Now it's actually lasting longer because mm -hmm. I think it's, it's different if you have avascular necrosis because mm -hmm. of the bones, especially if they continue to kind of die mm -hmm. after you've had the replacement. Right. Like the and shaft of the bone isn't. Even, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I was just going to say the shaft of the bone is supporting that joint. And so eventually, like, you'd have to replace the shaft and the joint right. itself. So and you're, why can't they get to the point where they're actually just solving the the, the cause? Stopping, stopping the necrosis. Right. So right. in other words, like right. feeding the bone with the blood. Mm -hmm. Right. Can't, they can't, I well, guess they I, can't I come up with something where they can actually. I'm sure somebody's researching it somewhere. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. Nope. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there, uh, I hate to interrupt you, Tara, but are there, are there things that you could do to relieve the symptoms 
or improve your quality of life as you're going through this? You know, like as a person, um, not medical. As an individual. As an individual. Thank you. Well, no, I, I think we do want medical. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you from research that I did, as far as exercise goes, low impact, um, aquatics is really good. Okay. Yoga. <laughs> Another good thing that I found actually has been tremendous for me is, is keto. What's keto? What I, is keto what I eat? Oh, like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought it was a new. I thought it was like a karate. Yeah. No. <laughs> keto. Okay. Okay. Stop it. The yeah. That was the diet. I was. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. No. Keto. So one of the things, one of the challenges is, you know, with your bones, whenever you have the avascular necrosis, it makes it really challenging to be able to work out and get exercise or to go on a hike or or things of that nature. Because it's kind of like um, a tire, your bones are. The more you drive, the more your tire wears down. And so with the avascular necrosis, it's the more that you walk, the more the bone collapses. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, right. Um, and so previous literature, I'd probably have to say, and there might be some orthopedics that still recommend it, although I, I wouldn't, that say non-weight bearing. Like don't don't walk. Try and limit your your walking mm -hmm. and all as much as possible, because that will prolong the collapse. But what I found changing my eating too mm -hmm. has allowed me to drop thirty six pounds last year. Mm -hmm. And congratulations! It, when I wasn't able to work out and do those things that I used to love to do, right. like right. running, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Do you still um, run in your sleep in your dreams? <laughs> is that just me? I, you know what I do sometimes yeah. from from scary PTSD mm -hmm. doctors that I've had from some of my experiences. But yeah, yes, I'm yeah. running. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Is it my turn? Yeah, it's your turn. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go fish. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, Tara? What role have your family and friends played in your healthcare journey? Yeah, especially your sister. Um. Okay. So. My family has been tremendous. Um, my dad and my mom have been my rock. I don't, I would not have been able to make it without them, which I'm not going to go into like my past or anything, but it, it's, it's different from how I grew up. You know, my dad was fighting his demons with the war, mm -hmm. um, but now he's he's my rock uh, luckily with covid um because he was in a, a war veterans home for the past 17 years and then covid happened and i found out that they weren't allowing their workers to wear masks Ooh, and so nice. i had him yeah oh yeah yep wow in april yeah i have that recorded but anyway wow. um what state are you in so what state are you in i'm in louisiana, louisiana okay. right now okay. So um, I had him discharged, and so he's been able to be here with me, it, it, although it's been extremely challenging with my stuff, but sure. um, we've been able to support, support each, each other. Support each other, right, too. right. And it's, yeah. it can be and, nice to meet your parents again as adults, yes. you know, to get to know them again as an adult. Yeah, exactly, yes. And so it's been, um, my family has, has been amazing um is i don't even know how to say this and dance around it i, I probably should have prepared better for that question um you, don't, you could leave you it you can skip it you can we skip, can skip it. it okay whatever's comfortable uh, for you and and if you want us to edit this out we could also edit that part out sure okay well let me just say this um i fell into probably one of the darkest places of my life that i've ever been in um I am honestly lucky to be alive. Uh, there were days that I didn't know if I would make it, if it wasn't my health bringing me to the brink, it, my physical health, it was my mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so every single relationship in my life was affected. Um, currently where we stand, uh, my mom and my dad are my support system. And I'm rebuilding everything else. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
Yeah, and I, I think okay. um, mental health and physical health definitely go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Yes, for yeah. sure. Definitely. Absolutely. And when you're fighting for your life, um, you don't have like a lot of the energy to use on those relationships mm-hmm. to, to work on those. And so we understand that. everything yeah. is affected. You know? We understand that, yes. Yeah, and you're in, yeah, your friends and family have to be very understanding. You're not able to do the things you used to do, and they really do have to make an effort. Right, right. And some people right. just can't really put themselves in the shoes of another person that has a chronic illness, mm-hmm. uh, and it's right. difficult. And, yeah. you know, you, you, you might have to just excuse them and say, well, it's just not within their uh, purview. Yeah, per to, uh, Yeah, right, yes. right, right. Look, this isn't really a part of the script, but I'm just curious, and, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Have you been able to see someone or talk to a therapist or? Uh, oh, I have a it, yes, yes. Okay. I have. A, I've had a therapist for um, probably like ten years. Okay. Um, who I call her my life coach, actually. Sure. Okay, She's right. wonderful. Yeah, anybody yeah. with a anybody with a chronic illness that's uh, causing pain on a nonstop basis, I think personally should consider yeah. a therapist. Right, but people look absolutely. view it differently. Right, right. I know. Yeah. But that's personally, why I kind that's of my opinion. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My opinion yes. is that it's needed. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's such there is still a stigma mm-hmm. in many ways about um, therapy and and mental health, but uh, honestly. There is an even if you don't think that you have a mental health, you know, reason to seek help. We all have things that we could improve on, well, and certainly. why, you know, why wouldn't we want to? That's right. exactly what a therapist would help you do. You know, so right. um, yeah. that's just my thought. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, right. Absolutely. Just, some people have that thought of these are my feelings. I hate for anybody else to know what I'm feeling. I'll just deal with it yes. internally. Um, yep. and, and, you know, again, I mean, people look at it, people view it, people process it differently. Uh, I'm in total agreement with what Lita and Jean Marie and what you're saying about it's great to talk with someone. But again, because of the stigma and all that, a lot of times there's people out there that say, I don't want anybody right. to right. know what's going on. But it, it is coming into play in more, um, for example, like with organ mm-hmm. transplant getting counseling is not an option it's a requirement right. right and because they realize that you really you you need assistance and you you need some help right and it's a big deal and i think the more and more we integrate health and and take it in as part of the whole health package the better it is for everyone right and this it, way it reduces fact, if, that stigma. if we would have started that way back when medicine started right and said mental health and physical health are hand in hand and if you go to a doctor and you're being seen for something that's chronic, I mean, if it's something that's that's short lived and the doctor fixes you, there's right. probably. But if it's chronic, I think that you should automatically say, well, because of this chronic illness, you automatically, you know, should go to. It should be included. Right. It right. should yeah. be included. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I was just going to say, I think there needs to be like some type of chronic illness case manager, care manager. Mm-hmm. Whenever somebody is diagnosed, that they're referred to that person. And there's information that is given to them, based, especially based off of that condition, and it includes all of what you're saying. Absolutely. Right. right. Because there right. is a huge gap in many ways on in chronic illness, especially rare disease. Like that, mm-hmm. like it, I mean, it takes a, a good year for somebody just to get their bearings for any condition right, you want to make it. it a rare a rare disease and then that it it adds to it because there's only a handful of people who actually have the knowledge that you need in order to find the treatment that you need and oftentimes you have to travel extensively i've had to travel across the country and figure out financially how you were going to afford it i've had to get extremely creative i found a lot of my doctors based off of uh, research articles that I read because there wasn't actually an organization for my condition. So it, there's so much that needs to be done in this this arena. <laughs> um, but all of what you're saying would be great too. <laughs> well, yeah. that leads me to my next question. Uh, Tara, what is the best advice that you've received 
for coping with a rare disease and what advice would you give to somebody recently diagnosed with a rare disease? The best advice that I received was um, you have to be kind to yourself Mm -hmm. um, and take one day at a time. And I know that that it really sounds cliche because you hear, you know, one day at a time, but you get so exhausted trying to just trying to find the most simplest thing. And all you want to do is like just find answers and you can't even find an answer. Uh, I won't even get on people who are misdiagnosed, but it, it's really easy to get discouraged and you beat yourself up over things. So I think that that was the best advice that I received for coping right. and that to surround yourself with people who will help you see a side of you that you can't see. Like to bring out the positive from you? Yeah. Well, that will remind you of the, the good in you because you're going to be struggling really hard. You're not going to feel like that person right, at all. Right. right. Good advice. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Kara, um, how can our listeners learn more about you and also about AVN? Um, and do you have any, any social media accounts out there that you want to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can, can I go back and answer the, uh, the rest of the, the rest of that of question? Oh, sure. Go back. Go back. back okay. Back. <laughs> okay. So, um, cause w- what advice would I give to someone recently diagnosed with a rare disease is, um, I would say, Research online to see if there's a nonprofit for that condition. Uh, one of the best places that I have found support is um, on social media support groups. Facebook has so many support groups, and specifically about the avascular necrosis support group. That's where Dr. Michael Mont, um, the one that the avascular necrosis guru, every two weeks. He goes on, he does a live Q&A and invites anybody on that support group to Perfect. participate and ask him any question that you want whatsoever. I you love can send it. Him your, yep, you can send him your, your, your discs. He'll look at it, develop a treatment plan for you, do all of that for free. Like wow. he is, yeah, it's amazing. So for any rare disease, I, I don't know, I, I wish my other conditions had that type of um interaction mm-hmm. but the avascular uh, necrosis support group does and it's amazing so i would definitely start with support groups um social media look for the nonprofit associated um national organization for rare disease nord right. is a place to start too okay. um that will lead you to any nonprofits potentially to finding help and uh, another option is research articles. That's how I found a lot of the doctors that I went and saw was based off of who wrote the research article. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but that was my advice. Okay. Thank you. How can we learn more about you then? Uh, more about me. I will, I will send you my social media contact information. And I am actually starting the next weekend I'm going to start documenting my journey. Oh, okay. great. Want- like a blog? Yep. Like in a blog? Okay, great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. Okay. Well, on a blog. Excellent. Excellent. We'll make sure yep. that we put a link for that in our website. Yes, because I want to hopefully share and um, hopefully I can help others that have maybe experienced the same things that I have, um, even especially with the surgery that I'm going to have to sure. have to. Get ready for it. Right. Uh, excellent idea. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. Well, Tara, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us today. And we're looking forward to speaking with you in the future about uh, the other uh, issues that you're dealing with. So we'll be scheduling we'll be scheduling other appointments for you in the future. Great. And I'm like, I got my first podcast down and there's nowhere to go. I can only improve, <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, it's going to get you much did- better. Yes. Oh, yes. you did fine. Don't yes. worry about it. Yes. You and did fine. I, we're going to definitely. I didn't be, even. <laughs> we're going to definitely be pushing this uh, episode uh, into our veterans network so that uh, other veterans and children of veterans will be aware of this as well. 
I'm going to too, and that's why I was going to ask you guys for your so all your social media sure. y- yes. stuff because I had already created uh, like the post, and I want to post it and great. Prefer, great. Although although I'm really reluctant because I so I wrote down all of my answer like I've rehearsed this, so <laughs> a lot of what I said is not even on what I wrote. Okay, so, all right. Maybe we should I'm do like, that. I, yeah. I don't even know what happened. I don't even know what happened. And I'm like, what I wrote is probably like a lot better than what I said. And I was like, oh my gosh, why did you do that? It always goes that way. It always goes that way. The only reason we use a script is, uh, well, I think it's because of me. Uh, I have early onset Alzheimer's. And if I don't have a script in front of me, I forget where we are. I forget who we're talking to. I forget uh, quite a bit. So it keeps me focused. And I think it helps keep us from talking over each other because when there's three of us on this side of the microphone talking to you, um, it, it kind of limits how much we're talking over each other. So it helps us. Yeah. And I tend to ramble. Okay. So, <laughs> and I guess I tend so, to interrupt. Yeah. So it if works I tell for you us. That I had, so if I tell you that I had the script in front of me, will that scare you? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. You okay, because yeah. I had it in front of me and I still rambled and went off topic. And I'm like, and I no. didn't even good. do it. And I was like, oh my gosh. Good. You're all good. I'm, I'm, you glad, are you, all good. I'm glad you did because yeah. it turned out wonderfully. Thank yeah, yeah, you very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you. And you actually, much. We, we do appreciate you coming on the, the show this morning and sharing your story with us. Um, quite interesting to say the least. Oh, and yeah. I'm sure that all of our listeners out there uh, learned a lot from mm-hmm. this episode. I learned Absolutely. a lot. I did too. And we're looking forward to having you come on in the future to talk about some of the other conditions that um, you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. And I have like, so I have so much better documentation that I could provide. Um, well, you know what you could do is you could send me those links through email, okay. and, and, and we'll then add when them to I, our Pinterest right, when I when I uh, build the website, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you'll get your own page on our website, and then I put links for everything that you would like uh, oh. on our on your website page, and this way people awesome. can go right there. Yes. Yeah, and then we'll have a Pinterest page for you as well, and that'll have direct links to any um, research that you'd like to cite or uh, any documents or articles as right. well. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So good, because I have all of those, uh, like I have the uh, a whole slew of medical, even research and citations mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Exactly. and everything. And exactly. Even stuff we, about Agent Orange. So, right. Like, Very important to, to include. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, well, thank you yeah. again. Um, if our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment before undertaking a new healthcare regime, and never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard in this podcast. Till next week. (laughs) 